everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Deborah Lampert Rudman. I'm the Curator of Education and Public Programs at Morven Museum and Garden in Princeton. And I'm excited to welcome you this evening for our visit to The Mount, Pulitzer Prize winning author Edith Wharton's Massachusetts home. I have uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Please keep your camera and microphone off so you can fully enjoy this evening's program. And please write any questions you have in the chat at the bottom of your screen. And now to formally welcome everyone, I'd like to introduce Morvin's Executive Director, Jill Berry. Thank you, Debbie. Welcome. I am Jill Berry, the Executive Director at Morvin Museum and Garden. Well, here we are with our final Grand Home and Garden talk. If you've been with us for the entire series, I hope you will agree it has been a wonderful season for armchair travel in a year when most of us were looking for a little escapism of our own. Our final woman of the house is quite the woman. I knew her as an author, of course, but I had no idea about the rest of her amazing talents. I'm excited to learn more from Ann Schuyler this evening. I would like to thank this evening's lecture sponsor, Callaway Henderson. Judd and his team have been involved with Morvan for years, and I'm delighted they are here tonight to share their specialty, Grand Homes, uh, to all of us through this presentation on the Mount. So once again, we are also welcoming Elizabeth from Baxter Construction for our final toast of the series. Elizabeth, take it away. Thank you, Jill. Oh. Sounds like it's working now. Right. <laughs> Jill, my name is Elizabeth Whistler and I'm Director of Marketing at Baxter Construction. I am so excited to be here tonight with all of you. I cannot believe we've made it to lecture four already. And I'm almost a little sad that after tonight it will be over. But I want you to know if you run out of things to do, go to the Morvan website and look up the plant sale and buy some plants. I do it every spring and I love it. One of my favorite things to do is buying plants and to do it and support Morvan just it thrills me to no end. Baxter Construction is the lead sponsor for this lecture series and we've been so honored to support this wonderful event. And I also wanna thank Callaway Henderson for supporting Morvan in this lecture series. And when pillars of the community get together and support such a wonderful organization as Morvan, it's exciting. It puts just energy back into the community. And I love that. So with that being said, on behalf of Baxter Construction, I would like for the last time of the season to raise my glass and toast each and every one of you. And thank you for supporting Morgan. Cheers. Thank you so much. Oops, sorry. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, historically, I think Elizabeth was raising her Roman punch there. Historically, Roman punch, when it was served, comes between the roasts and the game, thus preparing the palate for the new flavor. At least that's what fine Gilded Age ladies and gentlemen were told by quote unquote well known and popular author Maud C. Cook in her book Social Life. Tonight we'll travel from 1902 through 2021, enjoying our Roman punch, while Anne Schuyler, Director of Visitor Services at the Mount, Wharton's elegant estate in Lenox, Massachusetts, shares the passion very well known and popular author Edith Wharton had for architecture and gardens, as well as her writing. I would like to introduce you to Anne Schuyler. And there's Anne. Okay, so I hope everybody can see me, hear me, um, and we'll get through this technical wonderment that is Zoom. Um, <laughs> um, I am very pleased to be here and I appreciate um, Debbie and everybody at Morgan House um, for this great idea. And um, I hope that at the end of this, um, you will have a lot of places to visit. So we're gonna start out uh, telling you a little bit about Edith Wharton 
and the house that she built here in Lenox, Massachusetts. I don't know how many people have been here, but we are located in Lenox, Massachusetts, which is um, right in the corner of Southwest Massachusetts, uh, about less than 10 miles from the New York line. Um, as Debbie said, probably most people today think of Edith Wharton as a great novelist. Um, she wrote The House of Mirth. She wrote The Age of Innocence. She was um, the first woman to, won, to uh, win the Pulitzer Prize, as a matter of fact, for The Age of Innocence in 1921, that, that the 100th anniversary um, of that event today. What you may not know about her is also her talents in terms of house design, garden design, um, the number of nonfiction works she wrote, as well as um, the fiction work that she wrote. This is a publicity picture, by the way. She's looking very swank. Um, 1905, The House of Mirth was her first really big novel. It put her on the map, so to speak. But we're going to be talking about some of her more garden-related and her uh, design-related books as we go through. But the first thing we have to talk about is Roman Punch, um, because um, um, it was a great idea. I, and when Debbie asked me what was her favorite drink, um, I kind of had a hard time because she um, wasn't much of a drinker, uh, or that's what she told us anyway. But in her fiction, um, she um, always talked about what, what the New York uh, uh, elite and the upper classes were drinking. And Roman Punch um, featured greatly in it. And I don't know whether all of you had a chance to, um, to, uh, to experiment with uh, Roman Punch. Um, but this is, this is an excerpt where she talks about it from the age of innocence. And again, that's a book that she wrote in, uh, 1921. And the last sentence particularly is, is I love, it says, as Mrs. Archer remarked, the Roman punch made all the difference, not in itself, but by its manifold implication, since it signified either canvas facts or terrapin, two soups, a hot and cold sweet, full decolletage with short sleeves and the guest of a proportionate importance. So Roman punch was not just a drink. It was a whole social clue about what type of dinner um, this particular um, dinner would be. And um, this I think is probably the more traditional type of Roman punch made with egg white, as opposed to sherbet and, and, the, and some of the more frozen uh, concoctions we've talked about. But let's go back to when Edith was a young girl long before she was writing about um, Roman punch. And this gets us back to uh, uh, her childhood. She was born in 1862 in New York. Um, she was um, uh, upper class family. Um, she didn't spend a lot of time in New York though. She was whisked away to Europe for most of her childhood. She was born, her father, George Frederick Jones, her maiden name was Jones, by the way. George Frederick Jones was a gentleman of leisure. He didn't, which means he didn't have a job per se. It means that he had the family um, uh, fortune to, uh, to manage. And most, by that time, most of the family fortune was in real estate. So the Whartons were wealthy, but they were not anywhere near quite as wealthy as um, the after the Vanderbilt or, or some of the, the very new money that was in New York at the time. Edith adored her father. He was tall, he was splendid. He died when she was 20 and that was a great tragedy in her life. Her mother on the right is named Lucretia Rhinelander Jones. She was very interested in clothes, in society. Um, she was uh, uh, the model young matron, so to speak. And if you've read any of Wharton's um, work, uh, some of the characters definitely have a hint of her mother in them. She had a troubled relationship with her mother. Um, she never felt that she could, lived up to her mother's expectations. She had two older brothers, Frederick and Harry. They were quite a bit older than she was. They were 12 and 16 years older than she was. Edith Wharton was born when her mother was 37. And that was sort of thought to be a little bit past all that in those days. Um, you were supposed to have your children early in your marriage, which she did. She had these two, bo these two boys and then, um, and then Edith came along. So Edith sort of all of her life seemed to feel not quite, at least she wrote about not fitting in necessarily. Um, and that was enhanced perhaps by her childhood experience. Um, her father in 1866, just uh, right after the civil war found it more profitable to rent out all his New York properties and take his family on an extended tour of Europe. So the young Edith Jones spent ages four through 10 
roaming around Rome, Italy, um, uh, Paris, uh, parts of Germany with her parents. So you can imagine um, it was very formative in terms of her taste, um, but perhaps difficult in terms of, of in terms of, of forming friendships and sort of feeling at home. She 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 didn't really have a home for for several uh, for six years. She got typhoid fever at age nine, and she was brought back to New York. This was her childhood home. If any of you know New York, the building's still there. It's 14 West 23rd Street. Um, it is now a Starbucks. At least the first floor is now a Starbucks. So if you're ever in New York. Um, you can have a cup of coffee at her childhood home. At age 10, she was already quite the architectural critic. She hated New York. She said it was the ugliest place she'd ever seen because she had been so spoiled um, by the great cities of Europe. Um, she spent a lot of her childhood, uh, not in New York, but in her parents' Newport home. They had a, they had a home in New York and they had a home in uh, Pencraig in Newport. Um, and she really enjoyed Newport, actually, the nature, the gardens, um, kind of running around. She, she describes it um, um, with great joy. Newport shows up in her fiction um, as well um, later in her life. Her biggest joy, however, as a teenager and as she was recovering from typhoid fever, um, I think we were having a ghost discussion earlier, perhaps. Uh, Edith Wharton was a great writer of ghost stories. And some of this may be, uh, this, some of this stems from when she was recovering from typhoid fever when she was a teenager. She seemed to be beset by fears, fears of something dark and menacing approaching her. Um, she couldn't sleep in a room that had a ghost story in it. She'd have to burn the book. Um, so she went through quite a little period as a teenager in the early 20s, but what saved her really was access to her father's library. And this is a book of Anglo-Saxon poems that she translated when she was a teenager. Um, so she, she, as a teenager, she spent hours and hours in her father's library just soaking up, um, soaking up the education she could find there. This is one of my favorite pictures of Edith Warden. It is a portrait that she drew herself. She was quite a talented sketch artist at age 14. Um, and it tells you all you need to know about what she thought about herself at age 14. Um, she um, has a book, she has a pen, uh, she has a piece of paper. And that was, that was her identity. Um, she was always a little self-conscious about her look. She always felt her hair was her best as, as, uh, asset. So she does have her long hair. She had long hair that went, reddish hair, auburn hair that went all the way down um, to her waist. She did fortunately find um, an excellent governess or her parents found an excellent governess, a woman named Anna Ballman, who helped her with German, as you might imagine, and also uh, a whole reading program throughout her child, uh, throughout her teenage years, essentially. She was not formally educated. So often you hear about Edith Wharton being self-educated. She had awful lot of access to books and she had this wonderful governess, but she didn't go to school per se. So the classics and, and some of like the math and sciences that the male sons, her brothers got, she did not have. Um, so she's um, around 19 or so. And of course her job is uh, not to be an author, but to get married. So she does meet a young man um, um, named Stevens and she gets engaged to uh, Mr. Harry Stevens uh, when she's about 19 or so. And this is Mrs. Stevens, Mr. Stevens' mother, Mrs. Perrin Stevens, who is actually quite wealthy. She was part of the new money set in New York. And here she is dressed as Queen Victoria for one of Mrs., I believe Mrs. Astor's costume balls. The engagement didn't work out. Uh, Edith's mother and Mrs. Perrin Stevens did not get along and they broke the whole thing up. So she, and that's not good in her age uh, to have an engagement um, break up. You, you've got a mark, a romantic mark against you, so to speak. So when she's 21 years old, goes up to Bar Harbor, Maine, and she spends some time with these two gentlemen. The gentleman on the top left is Walter Van Rensselaer Berry. Um, he went to Harvard. He is about her age, a few years older. Um, and he seemed, they seem to strike up a real bond. Um, and she perhaps they go on, you know, walks in the woods and canoe rides and she perhaps thinks that he is going to ask her to marry, but he does not. He goes away to Washington DC to pursue his legal career. Um, he would come back into her life much later and become very important, but for right now he's gone. Um, 
and she's still unmarried. Um, so she spends some time with the other gentleman on the right there. His name is Teddy Wharton, Edward Robbins Wharton. He is a friend of one of her older brothers, so she has known him growing up. He is 13 years older than she is, um, but uh, he, he starts to pursue her and they get engaged um, in around 1884. This is quite the family portrait. Um, her mother, Mama Lucretia, is the one in the middle, obviously, with the dog. Teddy Wharton is on her right, and Edith Wharton, in not one of her better fashion choices, is standing in the back there on the right. Um, dogs, dogs are very important in this whole story. Everybody loves dogs. Everybody has dogs. Um, so they get married at Trinity Chapel. Um, in April of 1885, uh, West 25th Street, fairly uh, subdued affair. Uh, Teddy Wharton's father is actually quite uh, ill. He has committed himself to McLean's Hospital outside of um, uh, Boston and couldn't attend and couldn't attend the wedding. They move to Pencraig Cottage on the estate of her parents. <laughs> or her mother, um, her father's died by this time. Um, and she starts to sort of create her first home. Um, at this time, she's written some things, but she's not what you would call a professional writer, even though since you know the minute she could walk, she's had this compelling um, need to tell stories. She's published a few stories, a few poems, um, but, but she's, she's trying to settle down to um, married life. It doesn't go well, though. Um, they're not, they share, they have certain things in common, but they're not like, it doesn't seem to be a really physical, passionate, uh, passionate marriage. They never have any children. Um, they do love dogs. They love travel. Uh, and they get on in the first, in the first years of their life. Um, luckily, she gets um, a big inheritance from a cousin who dies in 1888. And she gets, um, what would be over uh, oh, $3 million or so in today's money um, in an inheritance in 1888. And she, she uses it to buy a new house in Newport, a place called Land's End. Um, and it's still there if anybody knows Newport, it's right on the water, beautiful location, but she didn't actually like the house. She called it an ugly wooden house on a piece of rock. Uh, but she uses her creative artistic um, um, energy to start redoing it. Um, Cause she's got all the stuff stored up from all of her travels in Europe, all these ideas about uh, taste and design and architecture and aesthetic. Um, so she hires a young architect named Ogden Codman Jr. He's from Boston and they start about redoing her house in Newport. And they had to, they discover that they have so many things in common that they write a book together. And this is Decoration of Houses, which was published in 1897, co-authored by Edith Wharton and Ogden Codman Jr. And this is her first major success. This is the book that, that uh, makes her a professional author, really. And she becomes an expert on house design. And what this is, is um, a rebellion against Victorian house design and an advocation of sort of a neoclassical, um, cleaner, simpler uh, type of design based on symmetry, balance, and proportion and moderate, what, she, what they call moderation. Um, this is what she was rebelling against. This is her mother's drawing room in 1880s. Lots of draperies, lots of fabric, lots of chintzes. Um, and, and she writes about this in the book, it's just horrors. Um, and what she's advocating, what she and Con, uh, Codman are really advocating something more like this. This was her, the stair hall in Lens and, in Lens and after Codman, um, restoration work on it. So you can see very classical, very clean lines. Um, and that stairwell actually is, is very similar to the stair, that stairwell here um, at the Mount. Now, this was Newport, 1880s. Teddy liked Newport. He was a great athlete. He loved playing tennis. He was very sociable. But Edith uh, more and more grew to really dislike Newport. She thought the sea and the salt air was unhealthy, and she didn't like the constant social demands of Newport. Um, um, Edith was of her class, but she didn't always enjoy being with her class. Um, and she really wanted time to write. And um, so she and Teddy, uh, found property out here in Lenox. Teddy's family had summered in Lenox for quite a while and started building the mount. And the top picture obviously is a fairly modern picture of the ground. The bottom picture, 
picture is one of our favorites. It's a panoramic, kind of unusual in those days. And over on the top left, on top of the rocks, that is the figure of Edith um, scouting out the site. Teddy is here pointing to something. And there's a little dog right here. Dogs are everywhere. They were definitely part of the family. The Whartons never had any children, but they had little dogs running around all the time. Now, this was the neighborhood that they moved into, just to give you an idea of where they, what Lennox was like. Lennox was called the Inland Newport, again, because a lot of the same people uh, built um, summer places. There were 75 summer cottages that went up in the late, um, in the late 19th century. Uh, Pine Acres here, that was Teddy Wharton's um, mother's house. So that was Edith's mother-in-law's mother house, uh, which is still there. Um, Ventforth Hall is about a mile away from us right now. It's, it's Jacobean um, thing that was designed by the members of the Morgan or for members of the banking Morgan family. And then Shadowbrook, which no longer existed, burned down. But at one point it was the largest private home in the United States before uh, Vanderbilt built, built more. Uh, Andrew Carnegie lived in Shadowbrook for a very short period of time. So that was the neighborhood they were moving into. Um, but this was also the neighborhood. They, you had to have people who supported this enterprise. And this is a, a street in Lennoxdale, which is where the working class um, folks live. A lot of immigrants, a lot of French, and a lot of Irish immigrants live down there. So this is the type of house that Wharton, and gardens actually, that Wharton wanted to build. And I love this postcard because this is a very early postcard, probably from, um, uh, 1903 or so or 1904 because you see the gardener he's still working down here and um, the grounds had not yet been developed so the house was finished in 1902 um, in September of 1902 the grounds uh, and the gardens it would be another three or four years before they um, they would be finished um, but again symmetry balance proportion that a, a classical feeling that's what they were going for um, and here you get an overview. And it wasn't just the house that had to fit together. All pieces of the landscape and the garden had to, had to um, fit together like a piece of art. That was her aim. Um, she has an interesting quote. You can probably read it several ways. Uh, she said, we have to make things beautiful. They do not grow of, of, so of themselves. So she wasn't one to just go out and find something you know, completely untouched. There was always a little bit of, of art and artifice in in making beauty, but she was a woman who loved beauty and she loved structure. Those were sort of the building block of her personality, which show up in her literature as well. So the, the man who actually um, designed the mount is a man named Francis L.V. Hoppin. Um, he was the architecture of the mount exterior. He uh, had worked at one point for um, McKim White uh, and Meade. He was very much um, in the kind of um, classical uh, type of aesthetics uh, that that Wharton um, approved of as well. So, you know, we often say that Edith Wharton designed the mount and she did, but it's not, she did have professional architects, uh, two, two of them actually. Um, the house is based on a English country house called Belton House, built in 1683. This is, Belton House is a lot bigger, you can see, um, but this is one of the earlier plans uh, of the mount. And so you can see some of the similarities, the balance, the balancing wing, the cupola, again, for sort of architectural interest and balance. This is one of the later plans of Hopkins, and it'll show you the great innovation. The, the thing that makes this house, I think, is this terror, and that was, a hop in addition to the original uh, English country house plans. It was an Italian influenced terrace that the Whartons insisted on because they had been traveling so much in Italy uh, that they knew how that could open up um, the landscape and, and just create an incredible gracious living area. And that's what it did. This is a picture of um, the terrace today. It's the east side of the house. The Whartons had an awning, very similar to that green and white striped awning. And this is where she would spend hours entertaining people like Henry James and this other friend of hers named Howard Sturgis. They would write on the terrace, read on the terrace, have tea on the terrace, tell stories on the ter terrace, stargaze. She was a devoted um, astronomer. Some of the books here in the library are, are astronomy books. Um, so that, and it is the center of the entertaining part of the house now as well for our kinds of functions. So 
um, a, a wonderful piece of architecture. Um, the view from the terrace uh, was also sort of Italian based. We don't have a lot of pictures of this view. Unfortunately, we wish they had taken more, but you can see from the terrace, it stretched out through open lawns. There's a little piece of water here, and then all the way out to the second piece of water, which is a lake called Laurel Lake. So it's a very Italian view sculpted by trees on either side. That's what they were trying to create. And it's really quite remarkable considering that they weren't here very long. Um, they only stayed in the Mount uh, less than 10 years, about nine years. And the intensive work on the garden happened in about uh, four or five years. So an awful lot of work went on. You can see on the right here, this little winding uh, tra trail that went down to the lake. So it was very much a lovely sort of gracious country place as well as an architectural statement, if you would. Um, the west side of the house, and this is the, the entrance side, this is how you would approach the house, is really quite different. It's rather stark. Um, it's perhaps a, a little forbidding. Um, Someone who's defense to being accused of lies is basically saying, oh, uh, you the, the architect that... Um, That's even. One of the architects that she didn't hire, Ogden Codman Jr., he got a little snitty about this view and he said that it was looked like a laundry yard. Uh, it doesn't quite look like that now. A few more trees have, have grown up, but definitely the better side of the house was the garden side of the house. So this is where you came in if you were lucky enough to get uh, invited and then you would get to the garden side of the house. This is also you came in if you had a car. Um, the Whartons were great um, uh, fans of early motor cars. And this is right in front of the front door. So you see this little glass globe, um, the sitting in the back seat, Edith again with that terrible hat is sitting next to Henry James. Uh, in the front seat is the chauffeur, a man named Charles Cook. And then holding the dogs off to the side with the pipe is Teddy Wharton, her husband. They love taking rides around uh, the countryside. If any of you have read Ethan Frome, some of the scenes of rural New England, um, she would have soaked up. She claimed she had a photographic memory. She would have soaked up from some of these rides throughout the countryside. And this was a, a recent picture because they had horses as well. We had a carriage, um, uh, a carriage display, uh, a local group, and it just shows you how beautifully proportioned the forecourt is for carriages as well. Um, this is a then and now a picture of the for, of the gallery. The gallery is the main foyer in the house. It's actually on the second floor, what we would call, what Americans would call the second floor. Uh, the Whartons use the European nomenclature of ground floor, main floor, and bedroom level. So this is on the main floor. The gallery was a place uh, where you displayed some of your um, art treasures or your, your sculptures, and then you proceeded to the next room. But you can see here the European influence, the French and Italian influence, lots of light, so different from the Victorian houses she had grown up in. The arch ceiling, um, the use of the patterned floor, this is terrazzo marble floor, which is a marble chip, Italian technique, but using local material um, for very decorative and very practical. Um, uh, you know, there were, there were lots of dogs running around. It was very easy to clean. Um, so all through the house, she has this combination of both sort of practical and um, decorative uh, principles going. This is the historic picture of the drawing room, which is the living room, essentially. Uh, we don't have any of Edith Wharton's furniture left, alas. Um, she left the house in 1911. She sold the house. She took all of her furniture with her. Um, so we have a couple of these old photographs that we can use to try to recreate these rooms. This is the modern drawing room. Um, uh, we had the couch reproduced almost exactly and then used other period appropriate pieces to fill out um, the modern drawing room. Best room in the house is that this is the room I'm in. You can see behind me a little bit. This is the library. This was the beating heart uh, for Edith Wharton. Um, she really became a world famous professional writer while living in this, um, in this house. And so it was a very important um, room for her. Uh, she did not write in this room though, very importantly. She wrote in her bedroom upstairs, um, but she would entertain friends here and obviously read here. This is the map today, the library today. This is the wall right behind me with better light. Um, I told you just uh, that we don't have Edith Wharton's furniture, but we do very importantly have her books. Um, her books took a very long 
trip <laughs> at the time of her death. She died in 1937. She lived in France. Um, in 1937, she had two houses, two libraries, no children. She ended up giving uh, part of her library to her godson, a young man named Colin Clark, uh, who was the son of Sir Kenneth Clark, famous British art historian. And Colin Clark um, kept those books in his library for quite a while, the Clark uh, family mansion in um, Kent, England. And then in 2005, they were sold back to us. So since 2005, we have had um, part of Edith Wharton's library at the time of her life. We have about 2,700 volumes at, at the end of her life. Um, and as you can imagine, they, were, they are enormously precious to us and to Wharton scholars. They have inscriptions in them. Um, um, people gave her books. She underlined things and checkmarked things. So it's a real clue to her personality. French, German, Italian, Old English, remarkably talented in, um, read them all, <laughs> um, remarkably talented in languages. Um, that picture is right behind me as well. This was taken in this library. It's a publicity picture for the House of Mirth. She wrote the House of Mirth in this house um, as I said earlier, it was one of her, it was her real best through, best seller breakthrough blockbuster novel, made her a lot of money, made her a famous um, author. Um, so it's very important to her career. One of the interesting old things about Edith Wharton is she did not like illustration. So what you're looking at here is Edith Wharton's own copy, her own personal copy of the House of Mirth. Um, from 1905, and she herself has scratched out the name of the illustrator because she didn't like them. And she asked her publisher to send her a couple of copies without illustration. She didn't like any illustration. She didn't want anybody coming in between her um, and her reader's imagination. So I said books, um, these are a few of her books that we have in the library, The House of Mirth, you can see The Valley of Decision um, and um, Additionally, she had books on science, on philosophy, on nature, on gardens, as you might imagine, astronomy, uh, a really wide ranging intellect. And the library gives us a little bit of hint of that. She, as I said, some of her best friends would give her books and uh, inscribe them. Uh, Henry James is one of her very best uh, uh, friends, literary friends that she had. And this is a book that he gave her, I think it's the Golden Bowl. He says to Edith Wharton in sympathy, Henry James, November 1904. We have no idea what he's talking about. They had that kind of, re of relationship. We don't know what their inside uh, jokes are or anything, but they had a very close um, relationship. They both loved Leaves of Grass. One of their favorite books of Walt Whitman in this library where I am right now, the ghost <laughs> of Edith Wharton and Henry James are reading Walt Whitman to each other. They used to stay up very late at night um, and, and read passages aloud out of, out of poetry, uh, including Whitman. Um, now, this is an interesting picture. I put this in here because you can't imagine life at the Mount without the dogs. Again, the dogs were everywhere. And this particular picture was probably taken by Edith Wharton herself. She's a great fan of cameras. She had a little Kodak Brownie. Um, and on the left is Henry James. In the middle is her husband, Teddy Wharton. On the right, another friend of theirs named Howard Sturgis. And Nisette, one of their favorite dogs. I'm not sure that I mentioned it, but all their dogs were little dogs, um, uh, toy breeds. Um, Chihuahuas, uh, Pekingese, uh, Pomeranians, um, various types of terriers. They didn't have any large dogs. Uh, they both love their dogs. Oh, there's Teddy. Teddy probably has larger dogs than anybody else. Um, she wears them as a fashion statement. Uh, he went hunting and fishing uh, with them. So they, again, uh, were very much a part of their family because they did not have children, as I said. Another huge part of Edith's life particularly was gardening and Lenox was a big gardening community. Their garden shows got written up in the New York Times. I sometimes say that gardening was a competitive sport. Um, you, you were always, you wanted to have, you wanted to win the prizes in the garden show and, and have the best, um, the best garden. Edith Wharton wrote about gardening. Uh, one of her books that she wrote in 1904, a nonfiction book, is, is called Italian Villas and Their Gardens. She went to 75 different Italian villas to study what made Italian gardens magical. And she was building her own gardens at the same time. So a lot of what she was seeing in Italy went into her own garden. She also had the help of a very talented niece, a woman named Beatrix Jones Farron, who would be one of the most um, uh, talented and successful uh, 
landscape designers, garden designers of her time. Beatrix Jones Farron did gardens at Dumbart and Oak. Uh, she did gardens for the Morgans. She did gardens for the New York Botanical uh, um, Garden. She, she had uh, a, a huge list of clients and she was only 10 years younger than Edith Wharton. And so when Wharton was designing this garden, she helped out specifically. We know she drew this plan for Wharton's kitchen garden. So this is a kitchen and cutting garden, very formally laid out, but very practical. This is the only known picture of that cutting garden. It no longer exists. It's, it's long since gone. Um, but you can see um, uh, fruit trees of some sort, um, but a very formal um, layout. She also owned a lot of great garden writers, William Robinson, The Wild Garden, um, like a lot of good garden at the time, and still uh, always searching for that balance between the formal gardens and the informal garden. Um, last week, we talked a lot about um, Gertrude Jekyll. Wharton and Beatrix Jones Farron were a fan of Gertrude Jekyll. Um, Wharton has quite a few Jekyll books in her library. Roses for an English garden. She has lilies for an English garden. And in some cases, there's little tick marks on certain illustrations or um, something that obviously Wharton agreed with or, or uh, uh, underlined for emphasis. So that was a huge that was wonderful us when we were trying to redo the gardens and still guide this today in terms of what she liked. Um, because her Wharton's original gardens, you know, uh, disappeared, they disappeared over time and we had to restore them. Um, period postcard again. I love the postcard. Everybody, Wharton was a very private person, but she's got quite a few postcards made of her house. Um, um, quite interesting sort of cultural um, twist. But that is the view from the Italian garden. Um, and this is the Italian garden today. The gardens uh, were, each garden had sort of a, its own character, its own personality. The Italian garden is sunken, it's cool, it's cloistered, it doesn't have any bright flowers. We've done it in a scheme of, of green and white sort of based on some of Wharton's um, writings in terms of of the feeling and the nature of Italian garden. It is modeled after some of these Italian, old Italian villa gardens that, um, that she saw. So that's on one end of the garden. Um, the other end of the garden is the flower garden, French formal flower garden. Um, this is an old postcard of it. This is where all the bright flowers were. Um, these were where the pinks were and the, and the petunias and, um, but they are all very formally or the, the pathways and the structure of this garden is quite formally laid out. So you have the exuberance of sort of the perennial beds um, contrasted against the, uh, the formality of the structure and the pathways itself. Um, and, and that was very much a part of the tension that I think they were trying to create. The, the perennial beds were never allowed to go over into the pathway too much. Um, <laughs> This is a historic photo of that flower garden. Um, they were very fond of white petunias, as you can see. So the whole, uh, the whole fountain, um, we call it the dolphin fountain. You can just sort of see the, the dolphins there was uh, white petunias. We don't use too many white petunias now anymore for practical reasons because of all that deadheading. But I think this year we had white impatience around, um, around the fountain. This is another element of the gardens, which is the grass steps. Um, the historic photos on the left and the moderns on the right. Very rare to see these this grass steps recreated today. Um, at least on this continent, it was more common in Europe. Uh, we think we're the only state that has that has it, at least in the United States. Um, great framework for for flower beds and flowering shrubs um, like these uh, hydrangeas, and you can walk up them. It's great fun, actually. Um, the two parts of the gardens are held together by this long lime walk, which is uh, lined with European linden trees. Again, something she would have seen in Europe as well as some of the other states. Um, uh, called a lime wood because Europe, uh, European linden tree is called lime wood in um, Great Britain. So traditionally it was always called a lime walk even though they are linden trees. Uh, this another uh, view of the rock garden. Again, there should always be wild areas contrasted with more formal areas. So there are these stream bed areas, lots of ferns. Um, so depending on what your mood is, you could wander in the wilder areas or the more formal areas. Um, the woodlands, 
and just I happen to really love that little boy there. So he gets in the picture. But again, the woodland, uh, there were pathways. Her husband was a great horseback rider. Um, so all of all of the estate uh, would be available to be uh, used for the enjoyment of them and and for their guests. OK, so I'm going to go back now to a little bit of history. Edith Wharton and Teddy Wharton lived at the Mount until 1911. Uh, their marriage was, was deteriorating. Teddy Wharton developed what today would probably be diagnosed as bipolar disorder. Teddy Wharton had a series of affairs. And Edith had an affair with this man. I was going to call him a gentleman, but we usually don't call him that. A man, Wharton Fullerton, he's a journalist, American journalist um, who lived in France. And so at the age of 45, Edith Wharton had this two, three year on and off, passionate, volatile uh, affair with Morton Fullerton. He turned out to be a bit of a inconstant fellow, shall we say, had a short attention span. Um, uh, but for a while there it was very important for her because you get the sense that she never really had this passion with her husband. Um, and this was the first time she had had a real passionate physical affair. Didn't laugh, was over about, about 1910. Um, and by that time, Edith's marriage with Teddy was over. They sold this house to Mount in 1911. Edith moved to France. She got a divorce in 1913 um, and spent the rest of her life in France. Um, so the rest of her life, a very important chapter was World War I. She spent a um, great deal of time doing charity and humanitarian work in, in um in France in World War I, something that was very fulfilling to her. Uh, after the war, she bought another house with great garden that she had to work on called Pavillon Colomb, which was right um, north of Paris uh, with the dogs, of course, always. And the only time she came back to this country was in 1923. She came back to Yale to pick up her honorary doctorate of letters uh, at Yale. She was the first woman to get an honorary doctorate of letters. And that was the only time um, after about 1913 that she came back to the United States. She also had a lovely house in the south of France uh, called Chateau Saint Clair, which is in a town called Iers, um, and on the Riviera, and great gardens there also, acres and acres of gardens. So there's one um, biographer of Wharton who said in her final years, it seems she wrote just so that she could garden. Gardening was almost as equally uh, important to her as um, writing. So when she died actually, or close to when she died, she jotted in her notebook that these were her ruling passions. Justice and order came first, dogs, books, flowers, architecture, travel, a good joke, and perhaps that should come first. It's always been one of my favorite Wharton quotes. Um, a little bit about what happened to the house after Wharton left here. So they said Wharton left here in 1911. It was a girl's school for a while. It was used by an acting company for a while. It was unoccupied for a while. In, 19, in 1997, when this picture was taken, it was called a white elephant. It was in terrible shape. Um, and so in the late 1990s, as we started the restoration. You see some of the photos down here of the garden, just the bare outlines of the gardens were left. Um, all of the definition of the hillsides and the gardens themselves had to be, had to be restored. So this is the beginning of the restoration of the garden restoration happened between about 2000 and 2007 massive endeavor, um, had to redo the grass steps. Um, we were uh, assisted or the woman who ran the, 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 the restoration was a, um, a Harvard professor named, uh, landscape architect named Susan Child. She um, died a few years ago, I believe, but um, uh, she was sort of the, the academic um, genius behind the restoration of the garden. That gives you thousands of perennials and annuals were planted um, to when the garden restoration um, started. And that's what it looks like somewhat today. Um, a completion of, of the garden restoration. This gives you an idea of the four seasons of the garden restoration. Now the Whartons were never here in winter, although she did stay late into December, but, but winter for us is sort of one of our favorite seasons because you can see the lines of, of the garden so well without the vegetation. Um, and it's actually beautiful in winter. The, the Mount today, we do tours, obviously not this big in COVID times, this is from two years ago. Um, but we call ourselves a cultural center, which honors the legacy of Edith, of, uh, Edith Wharton's uh, humanitarian, literary and artistic um, legacy. 
uh, we have our rooms full of exhibit. Um, some of the bedrooms, not the major bedrooms, the extra bedrooms are used as exhibit space. Um, the gardens keep growing. This is the pergola in the Italian garden. Um, I said we had to replant most of the vegetation. The one exception is that grapevine that's over the pergola. That apparently comes from an original Edith Wharton grapevine. Um, this is the flower garden at, at full summer. Lots of flocks. She once wrote in a letter, she had about 32 different varieties of flocks. So that is one thing that we have tried to, to, um, to keep going, dahlias. Um, and we, use, we at the Mount uh, do lots of other things um, to celebrate Wharton's legacy. We, we host theatrical um, shows, jazz shows, um, family, family, um, family tours. We get famous writers in to give uh, speeches and artists, um, everything that a historical house has to do today to stay relevant and to, to be important to people. Um, and you can see that terrace up there being put to good use. Uh, it's still a place that's where you want to be on a nice summer afternoon. Um, one of my favorite shots, the horses again, the coach. Um, um, again, a, a, a biannual thing that happens, but you can see that's what it would have looked like in, in Wharton's day itself. And one of my favorite overhead shots that again, shows you the whole layout of this estate um, with the Berkshires in back and then the formal gardens transitioning into the more uh, natural rural uh, landscape of the, the meadow. And so that was another sort of Wartonian ideal was sort of a, a natural blending from the formality to the natural, um, nothing abrupt and nothing sharp, everything, everything harmonious. Har harmony was one of her favorite um, words. And that is it. Um, I will turn off my screen sharing now. That's our website, obviously. Um, and uh, you can go there to find out uh, if you're visiting um, the Berkshires uh, programs and, and what's going on. So I'm going to stop my share and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. You can hear us all cheering. Everyone's cheering in their, in their chairs. Um, there are, there are quite a few um, questions in the chat. So I'm gonna to go to the first one here. Do we know if Hoppin actually visited England to see the house in Lincolnshire in person? Yeah, quite sure that Hoppin did. Not, not totally positive that Wharton did, but probably. Um, um, and uh, certainly Belton House actually was quite, um, it was on the cover of like Country Life. It was quite sort of the architectural model. Um, is quite popular. So you would have seen it on the magazine cover, um, even if you didn't get their person, but, but Hoppin, um, Hoppin went to England for sure. Thank you. Uh, how many acres are maintained? How many acres are maintained? Um, right now we have 49 and a half total on the estate. That is uh, the Whartons had about 128 at top at, at the peak of their holding. Um, some of the nature changes over the year and some of the what used to be what meadow when the Whartons were here is now sort of marshy um, is, is wetlands essentially. So I would probably say we maintain maybe 20, 25 acres, but we have trail through some of the woodland areas and it is one of our executive directors um, dearest hopes and one of our aims is to recreate the original footprint of the estate because thankfully the border bordering the abutting uh, for the most part hasn't been built up or developed so we will be able to create the original footprint and and just have trails and things on the original footprint so people will get an idea of the um of the uh of the the scope the original scope of the estate great thank you and this question refers to the library where you're sitting. Um, this person wrote, I have a new book, What a Library Means to a Woman, Edith Wharton and the Will to Collect Books by Sheila Liming. I would love to hear any information or insights into Wharton's personal library, how she went about designing it, maintaining it, organizing it, and how incorporating those interests into the design and maintenance of her home. Double question there. Great question, no. And and Sheila Liming is, is one of our great friends. She um, started out as a project uh, 
quite a few years ago of digitizing the books behind me in the library. So um, actually she has her own website. You go to Sheila Lyman's uh, website and you can pull up images of um, scans of these books, not the whole books, but like the inscription pages or the, or the title page um, in some cases. And so she did this, uh, a wonderful book um, based on it. Wharton, um, she wrote about libraries in the Decoration of Houses. Um, uh, she wrote about every room in the house in Decoration of Houses. The Decoration of Houses, if you're interested in reading it, is organized um, very methodically room by room. And one of these rooms is the library. And she says a couple of things about um, libraries and Decoration of Houses. She says the books should always be the centerpiece. So she's scathing in some of her fictional works about people who sort of just have libraries um, you know, to say they have a library and, and the books are really sort of secondary. She says the books should always be the centerpiece of any library. So they should look like a tapestry, like effect. Bookshelves should be inset uh, and movable. So she's very practical as well. Um, she also said in the Decoration of Houses that despite what most people think, which is sort of the English have the best library, she says the French had the best library. Um, and so when she built this library, she used, um, the architect who did the inside of this house was Ogden Kahneman Jr. And he did a lot of, I'm, I'm looking at the walls, I'm sorry, I can't show them to you. They're quarter sawn American oak, um, kind of in an English style. So I would say her actual library here is, 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 is English and French. Um, and we don't know particularly how she organized the library, alas, because we don't, the, the pictures that we have aren't, you can't read the spines, they're not that detailed. So when we dress the library, um, it's it's pretty much based on subject, all the poetry books are together, um, history, literature, uh, things like that. Um, we don't know if that's what she did, but that was sort of the best guess at the time. Thank you. So the age of innocence uh, she won the Pulitzer for, how did that affect her life? Great question also. So uh, when she wrote The Age of Innocence, it was um, 1920. Um, she was living in France. She was had just gone through the trauma of World War I and really wasn't um, over it. As a matter of fact, she was writing a war novel and wanted to publish a war novel and had, had an agreement with the publisher. And the publisher at the last minute said, we don't want any more war novels. <laughs> uh, they don't sell. The American public doesn't want them anymore. And we want something more like the House of Mirth. So she had to switch really quickly and write The Age of Innocence. So it's really ironic that like her masterpiece was one she did in six, seven months and out of necessity because her publisher didn't want a war novel. Um, <laughs> but what it did, one, one thing that it did is that it forced her to go back to her childhood because The Age of Innocence is set in the 1870s, which is her mother's generation, her parents' generation, New York. Um, she was just a young child in the 1870s. And she enlisted her sister-in-law to go do research about who was singing at the opera house when, and she really wanted to get the details right. So it sort of forced her to go back um, and look at New York. And then she wrote another set of novellas called Old New York, which are really excellent. So she was sort of um, going back and remembering some of that material, even though she lived in France. Um, and the Pulitzer itself is sort of a funny story. Some of you might know it is that um, the Pulitzer was not very old. The prize itself had only been around for, for a couple of years. And when in 1921, they were going to give it to um, Sinclair Lewis and um, Main Street. And they had all voted on it. And then Columbia University, which um, oversaw the the, um, the Pulitzer, uh, one of the, the deans of Columbia University said, no, you can't give it to Main Street. He said, it's too, Main Street is too sarcastic, it's too bitter, it cuts down the morals of uh, the great American Midwest and you, you have to give it to somebody else. And so they gave it to the Age of Innocence, which when he just found out this, uh, you know, she was a little perturbed because one, it sort of meant that she was second best. Two, she was horrified that she had stolen it, so to speak, from Sinclair Lewis. Um, because she really enjoyed Main Street. And three, the, the Pulitzer, the, 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 the Pulitzer was meant to be what they said, the publicity for it was awarded to the novel that best upholds American um, morals and manhood or something like that, which is totally not what The Age of Innocence is about. <laughs> and he just wouldn't have wanted that to be about. So 
a little bit of chagrin. Uh, she accepted it. She was the first woman to win a Pulitzer. It did her a lot of good in terms of sort of restarting her career. It, it meant she could get published what she wanted to publish and she became a lot more influential. Um, it made her quite a bit of money. Um, she, she sort of jokingly says she, they gave her a thousand dollars. The prize for the Pulitzer was a thousand dollars. And she said, well, at least I could redo my gardens at St. Clair with a thousand dollars. So she's very practical, uh, but it was important to her career. It, um, um, uh, it, it, it sort of reminded everybody what a great writer she was. Well, thank you for that. Uh, the questions are popping in here. Um, so there are two that I'll kind of combine here. What is the best time of year to visit? Well, everything is, everything is, everything is COVID <laughs> controlled, but I would say normally, uh, non-COVID, um, oh gosh, um, the gardens start getting really gorgeous, I would say the end of June, um, early July, and then they kind of um, stay summer, midsummer glorious. Um, I really like the fall though. I mean, that's a personal thing for me. I, the fall garden is absolutely beautiful, uh, September. And, um, you know, the weather, the, the, just the turning of the, of the leaves and everything like that. So I'm not sure that I gave you a really bad answer. <laughs> I would say fall, um, <laughs> but um, uh, it depends whether you want to see a summer garden or a fall garden. So the gardens are open. Is anything open right now? Well, um, we, Normally, we would always close during the winter months because frankly, not a lot of people came to the Berkshires. Um, this past year has sort of changed that. We have kept our grounds open all, all through COVID actually last year and all this year. This is sort of a break from what we normally uh, did in the past, but people really seem to enjoy walking the grounds and even, even in the off season. Um, our official opening of the house and sort of when we get the grounds back into working shape, so to speak, is May 8th. Um, and so the house is available um, for tours uh, starting May 8th, it's on our website. You have to make reservations, all the COVID rules, um, et cetera, because we have to limit how many people are in it. But the grounds are essentially open all day, every day from dawn to dusk. A few exceptions to that, if you check our website, because we like a lot of places find ourselves doing a lot of weddings that didn't happen last year. Um, and uh, sometimes the grounds will close for weddings. Um, uh, so it's always helpful to check, but for, for the most part, the grounds are open dawn to dusk um, every day this year. And then the house starts May, the house starts May 8th. Um, and, and I see um, Nick Hudson just put the Mount's mm -hmm. website in the chat. So please look at the chat. There's, he also put um, Sheila's website. In the chat, um, the question here is: The Mount still hosting Shakespeare Company to perform Midsummer Night's Dream on the grounds? Oh, somebody who has been here. Um, <laughs> um, this year we're not. Well, okay. So a little background on that. Um, uh, during the '80s and the '90s, the Mount um, was the home of Shakespeare and Company, and Shakespeare and Company is um a, a local group of a local acting group a local theatrical group and they sort of rediscovered the mount it had been a girl's school and they bought it from the girl's school and they would put shows on both inside and outside and what the the caller is referring to is that outside on the terrace that was legendary place to do midsummer's night um uh, dream out on the terrace and people running around the woods and and the audience would sit on the grounds and um everybody around here still um, remembers that. So we're not doing that. We have, um, we have a relationship with Shakespeare and Company. I'm not quite sure what's gonna happen this year. I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to do a collaboration with them this year, but we have um, in past years, they've come and done a couple of performances, but not, not the way they used to. They now have their own um, very large, lovely campus uh, about a mile down the road where they have multiple theaters, um, but uh, we definitely want to keep a good, uh, we have a good uh, relationship with them. They were very important. Shakespeare Company was very important to the saving of the Mount. It, it might have just disappeared, but the people in Shakespeare and Company knew it was Edith Wharton's home. Um, and even though, the, you know, they, there were times that they couldn't uh, put a lot of money into the upkeep, um, they kept it alive, which was really important. 
that uh, ties in with a question that popped in here. Uh, when we visited 10 years ago, I think we were told the Mount was having financial troubles. Have you turned the corner? It looks great today. Ah, uh, we had financial problems, <laughs> uh, particularly in 2008. Um, that that we were almost foreclosed on. 2008, um, if everybody remembers, was not a very good year all around. And we had um, tremendous debt um, and we um, were almost foreclosed upon. But our executive director worked with a lot of the local um, financial institutions and we set up a furious fundraising um, campaign and we were able to renegotiate our debt. And then in 2015, um, we actually were able to eliminate our debt. So um, through a lot of hard work and a lot of really good friends um, who, who contributed. So we're in much better shape. We're still not, um, we're working on an endowment now. We don't have an, uh, uh, an official endowment as, as some places do, but that's something that we're working on. So um, yeah, and COVID of course didn't help. <laughs> Although we were, um, uh, we were able to, uh, we got some good government at NEH. We were, we were lucky to get some good government grants um, from COVID, but that, yeah, that didn't help either. But much better than we were probably when this, when these person, definitely than when this person visited. Thank you. So we have two final questions here. Um, do you know if the House of Mirth has any autobiographical elements of Edith Wharton? It's an interesting question because sometimes we read, those of us who like read way too much Wharton, sometimes we read too much into some of her books and think that there's a real person or a real situation um, hiding behind every character. Um, I think The House of Mirth, um, to very briefly sort of sketch it, if you haven't read it, is about a wonderful heroine, probably one of Wharton's favorite heroines named Lily Bart, um, who is all of 29 and therefore getting a little old on the marriage market, unmarried. She's beautiful. She's talented. Um, she's a great accoutrement uh, to any man. Uh, she knows what's going on. Um, and she refuses to marry the man that she probably should. And that sets in motion a, a, a whole series of events that led leads to a very tragic um, conclusion. Um, I think the autobiographical uh, elements are probably just in the type of society she grew up in New York um, and knew, she probably knew a lot of people who um, were the same sort of people that she puts in this book. Uh, I don't see her as Lily Bart personally, um, but the same, you know, the, what is in almost all Wharton books and so many of her books is particularly for women, um, their lack of choices and how marriage is almost always seen as the only choice for someone, for a, a woman to take. And, and that's very much what happened to Lily Bart. In Wharton's case, it was a little different. I mean, she didn't, she didn't bulk at getting married initially, but um, uh, you know, she really wanted to be a writer and, and, um, and, and bucked, uh, bucked sort of expectations to, to become a writer. So I think there's, there's a lot of um, autobiographical sort of elements in that, but I wouldn't say that as a particular person, at least I can't really think of, um, I'm sure that she put characters in there that, you know, reminded her of people that she grew up in and things like that, but in terms of the main characters. The other thing that I will say, and a lot of other scholars have said, is that the um, the character, so Lily Bart, her soulmate is a man named Lawrence Selden, and he is sort of a typical Wharton male in that he has a hard time making up his mind sometimes, and he's, he's very uh, attractive and intelligent, but he doesn't usually have a lot of money <laughs> or not enough money. Um, and he's her soulmate, and this is who she loves to talk to. Um, and she can't marry him um, because he doesn't have money. Um, and some people think that Lawrence Selden is a depiction of this man I talked about a little bit named Walter Van Rensselaer Berry, who was probably her soulmate and she never married and he never asked and um, uh, that we know of, <laughs> um, but was a lifelong friend. So sometimes in Wharton novels, you have the soulmates never quite meet up. They never. They never get together. And some people really read that as um, her relationship with Walter Berry, who was uh, just 
when you read her letters, her grief at his death is just heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. It's just she. He was such a uh, a close friend um, and and soulmate, um, but yet never a husband or, or anything like that. So there, there could be some of that in Lawrence Selden in, in House of Mirth. Thank you for that. So I'm going to combine the last question into two questions here. So she loved the mount, and so the question is why was it called the mount? And so she loved it so much, but yet she didn't end her life there. She went to France. So the other part of the question is, are Pavillon Combe, I'm going to say that wrong, and the Southern French property still there and open for visits? So double, double question. What was the first one? <laughs> the first part was um, she loved the mount. Why was it called the mount? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and then she left, you know, so about the, the French question. So it was called the mount because um, she named it after her great grandfather's place. She had a great, a favorite great grandfather um, who was a general in the Revolutionary War and um, a merchant. And he was quite successful That's where some of the family wealth came from. And, and he built himself a uh, estate in Astoria, Queens, which she initially called Napoleon's Mount. Napoleon being popular at the time when he built the house, when the Napoleon ceased being popular, he shortened it to the Mount. And she then used that name to call her house the Mount. And I never know whether the original house was supposed to be Napoleon's horse. Who knows? There's no hills really in, in Astoria, Queens either. But um, our mount, this mount, is built into a, a hillside. So it has more of a legitimate claim to um, being called the mount um, than, than uh, her great grandfather's place in Astoria, Queens. Um, she did love this place. And, and people always ask us, why did she leave it if she loved it? Why did, you know, she spent so much time building it and, and put her heart and soul into the building of it. And why did she leave after 10 years? And you know we'll never know the complete answer to that. Speculation is, of course, um, well, some people speculate, and I kind of do this some occasionally too, is that she loved the creative process. She loved building it. She loved creating it. And that might have been the most fulfilling part of it for her. Um, um, but she made a lot of long range plans for this, this place. So you have to think that she was thinking of living here for a lot longer. But with the breakup of her marriage, her husband's mental situation was really becoming untenable for her to handle. Um, and, um, and I think, I think she wanted a new start and she'd always loved France. Um, it was much easier to get a divorce in France. It was probably easy to live as a divorced French, uh, divorced American writer, intellectual in Paris than it would be in New York. Um, there was still, um, a stigma in her class anyway, against um, divorced, uh, women, particularly intellectual women. She became a real fan of French womanhood, um, particularly in contrast to American womanhood. Um, so uh, the houses in France um, are not open to the public, really. The Pavillon Colombe, which is north of um, Paris, is a private home. Uh, they will make appointments with researchers and things like that, but it is still a private home, which I believe is uh, still owned by a member of the family, royal family of Liechtenstein or something like that. So um, the house in Southern France, which is in a town called Iers, is, is uh, for many years was owned by the town municipal offices and they used the house as their offices. So the gardens were open, the house was not open and not really restored. I believe that's how it still is. Um, but if you're going to France, you better check, you better check first. Um, but it's on top of the hill and, and we just found out uh, some interesting, recently we got a, a box of artifacts um, that was sent um, to us uh, from a French scholar that we knew and she had done a lot of work in the air. And in that box is a, a visiting card for Wharton's garden. Wharton, as I said, she got really devoted to her garden. She spent a lot of time and money on the garden. She charged the public money to come see her gardens. And she had these little carte de visite, these little uh, it, uh, admission cards, essentially, um, that you had to have to have admissions to her to her gardens. So I think he's very sympathetic with her. Um, <laughs> as I, I mean, all, all of us are, all of the historic house and gardens uh, would be, but she, um, she spent a lot of time and, and money on her garden. So. If you go to France, you can probably you can probably get a look at the Ears house, um, even though it's not officially open to the public. But 
thank you so much. <laughs> That's great insider information. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. And this was just amazing. Um, and I think we're gonna, we've, we've kind of run out of time here, but we've all been so inspired by the gardens and by um, Edith Wharton's story. So I'm gonna close this by saying again, thank you to Anne and the Mount and that uh, spring is here. So we hope you'll all go check our online plant sale and uh, you know help support Morvan as well and watch for our upcoming garden tours and pressed flower workshop featuring Grace Kelly's works and wedding gown. Uh, thank you again to our series sponsor, Baxter Construction, and this week's lecture sponsor, Calloway Henderson Sotheby's International Realty of Princeton. And thank you again, Anne, for a delightful visit. Um, our finale, we raise a Roman punch to everyone. Thank you so much again, and we will see you all, hopefully at Morvan, at the Mount, and have a good evening, everyone. Great. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.